Blog Talk Radio. And we're back here on the Midnight Black Mass. Thank you for joining us. And now it is time to debut a very special segment here on the show that we're going to be moving forward with, uh, hopefully on a weekly basis, if not a very regular basis. And this is part one, and we only got 30 minutes, so I'm assuming we're probably not even going to get a, a fraction of the story here. But hopefully uh, we'll be able to bring this guest back for future episodes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show the professional wrestling agent to the stars, the founder of the Feast of NWA Wildside and a longtime dear friend of mine, Mr. Bill Barons. It is our honor to have you here on the Midnight Black Mass. Well, thank you so much. And this is, I, I have to admit, my first Black Mass. <laughs> yes, it, it is. <laughs> And uh, we've been doing the program here in, in one way or the other for about a year and glad to finally get you on in perfect timing for the NWA Wildside Chronicles. No better guest, I think, to go first in all this. So while we're moving along, why don't we go ahead um, and why don't you give us first just the Bill Barron's origin story. If this were a, a comic book hero legend uh, of a man that built uh, an indie wrestling empire, so to speak, what would the secret origin of Bill Barron's be? Well, the, the the wrestling nutshell version, uh, I started in TV as a television salesperson with a lot of companies like Universal Television and others, and periodically had contact with wrestlers in the 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s. I was helping wrestling companies get on TV, initially on what was called the Prime Sports Network, which eventually became Fox Sports years later, but it was at that time a group of regional sports channels, and they just needed programming. So I was calling Florida Championship Wrestling and and uh, Don Owen and all these other people, and Dave Woods, who owned Continental Wrestling, or had bought it from uh, from the Fullers, and, and I was getting these on TV, but I really wasn't in the business. 1993, uh, I wrote a letter to the Torch about a really stupid TV taping that was done in high definition in Texas with uh, Jim Crockett, who had just gotten out of his No Compete. And it was just stupid uh, because like, you know, only now are we only staggering into high def and only getting out of it what we are. And, you know, this is 1993, not even the Japanese were up to speed at that point. And here's this guy taping in high def like it's going to go anywhere. And, of course, it didn't, but a lot of people got paid and blessed their hearts for that. And that's sort of what I wrote. And Jerry Jarrett contacted me and said, hey, you seem to know TV and you understand wrestling, and I don't know many people like that. So would you help me find towns for USWA for my son Jeff Jarrett to be a promoter? We entered into an arrangement, um, and I did that. And I was going to be paid for that based on the markets I cleared because Jeff would then go out and promote them and everybody would be happy except Jeff didn't want to be a promoter. He just, his, you know, his, I guess he and his dad hadn't talked about this particular opportunity well. So now I'm going, well, you could keep paying me, but you're really going to get pissed off because you're not going to get much money back if nobody's promoting these towns. So he said, okay, well then just take the tape out with you when you're doing your other stuff and you know, get it on and maybe we'll figure out a way to get you paid. And that led to contracts with WWE and WCW as our distributor with me getting paid by them, consulting their syndication and time passed and USWA went out of business. And when it did, I owed a TV show to WWE on a Wednesday and on a Monday, we found out we had no shows anymore because there was no freaking company. So I had met Bert Prentice uh, because at the very end of USWA, he was in as a house show promoter and he and I were the only two guys allowed at the TV station to run the final TV taping. And you know, not only did I book it, but I had to run it. And so although we had not really gotten along, know each other, and we were, in theory, even on opposing teams at one point in USWA, Jerry said, get with Bird, he can get you a show. And by golly, he could. You know, we ended up with a Best of Colorado Kids show, which was what America was looking for, obviously. And <laughs> we... Uh, we went forward, and you know, soon after that, we did our first taping, and it was a pretty good little taping, and we packed out the fairgrounds. And then for about a year and a half, had a very good, uh, in general, run with First Music City Wrestling, and then I joined the NWA, and it became NWA Worldwide. And we discovered, among other people, Shannon Moore, Shane Helms, Christian York, Joey Matthews, the Bad Street Boys, all of whom accomplished at least a little something. Uh, in their careers, and we had a, a mix of sort of the old Nashville, Memphis territory young boys, a few of the older guys. Um, Dutch Mantell was, was part of our system. Uh, Stephen Dunn, Steve Dahl was a booker off and on at different times, as was Dutch. 
Um, I was TV boy primarily, and I would come in and do the tapings and functioned as a heel. And we were running Friday and Saturday nights, and we were drawing 500 on average on Fridays and 800 plus on Saturdays back to back every single week for an extended period. It's amazing to think back of that. We canceled Friday when we drew uh, around 350 for a main event with the Tennessee Vols against uh, uh, against uh, Brian Christopher and Spellbinder. Wow. And that's when we I went, mean, oh, God, 350. I mean, heck, we can't make any money on that. Well, now uh, anybody in Nashville who could draw 350, a, a legit gate, would be dancing on air. Um, yeah, exactly. But that exactly. was then. Exactly. But that was then, and this is now. And uh, I got tired of driving over the, the mountain, basically, and going to Nashville, so I started running in Georgia. First is Music City Wrestling Georgia, the stupidest name ever. And then finally... Around that time, I joined the NWA, and it became NWA Georgia. And weirdly, we sort of, I sort of started getting a reputation. I was asked to take over a building. I had never promoted before other than what I'd done in Nashville with Burton. He was the promoter. I, I suck as a promoter, but he was a really good promoter. I'm, I'm good at other things. Um, so I'm, I'm running Loganville on Thursdays, and all of a sudden I'm running a skating ring on Sundays, and I'm doing other shows here, and I'm doing two, three shows a week. And Next thing I know, talent wants to work for me, and WCW people are coming in on various nights out of nowhere, and it just sort of got a buzz around it, and we're in this little, you know, terrible uh, flea markety building on Thursdays, but all of a sudden we get a whole bunch of folk coming in, and we're starting to get known, and among those people, uh, we heard from Steve Martin, who was uh, working as announcer Chance Williams, and uh, Ray Rawls, Rick Michaels, who had been running a show called NCW for a while, and not a long while, but for a while in Cornelia, and were drawing. They were, it was the first thing that I guess that town had really had in terms of good live entertainment, quite honestly. And they were drawn, and they had sponsors, and everything was going good, I thought. Um, and when they came in, that was the pitch. Uh, we're doing this great thing, but we really need somebody like you, Bill, because you could get us on TV, because the TV I was doing with Bert was now running in Atlanta, uh, in late night and well received, and we were all over the country, fifty some percent of the country at various times during this period of time. We're able to see our show, an amazing quantity of people that later used to amaze our talent when they started traveling and realized people knew who the crap they were. Um, you know, you don't realize that how the impact of television, at least back in the day, and this is now a story of back in the day, until you get on the road and people start telling you, and you know, you go to Chicago and somebody goes, "Hey, I, you know, I see you on TV." You go, "Really?" Holy crap. Yeah, so, actually, X-Pac is a, a pretty famously known NWA wild side yeah, fan. Yeah, he was that one guy up at 2 in the morning in Milwaukee. Uh, that, that <laughs> we, we knew he had a fan. We just didn't know who it was. But we were also on in Philly. We launched the block that created ECW in Philly, and, and everybody else was paying except us. Uh, so we really had sort of a magical life. But but that wasn't hadn't even started. They came, said, start TV, and I came in, and it really was – a fight at some level because while everybody said yes to me and I wanted to do something different, I didn't want to do NWA Georgia. I didn't think that was fair. I said, let's come up with something else. And literally Burt Prentice came up with the name Wildside, And I liked it. I just thought it, it was a cool name. And so I said, let's do NWA Wildside. Well, then Steve had his panties in a wad and, and, you know, and everybody's healing everybody else out at different points, you know, you know, he doesn't want to do it, I don't want to do it. And that was the dynamic between Steve and Ray. Neither could tell the truth to the other uh, if they had to. It was impossible for them. Uh, they, they both were habitual liars at some level. And um, so we end up, okay, we're NCW outside. What the crap? Let's just get this thing going, sanctioned by the NWA. And they wanted to be on, you know, we got going. We started doing okay. The show was Eh, it was all right. It, we had a lot of their old talent, a little of my talent, and about 50% of the whole crew sucked. And, you know, we had, you know, fat guys and guys in T-shirts and people that could bleed more than wrestle because Steve was a big fan of blood and violence and, you know, hardcore and holy shit and all of that garbage. And it, it so it took a while to start to transition. And, uh, they wanted to be on TV at a better time period. So I got them on a station called WHOT channel 34 at nine in the morning on Saturday, but it required a $500 weekly fee. We hadn't paid anything before Nashville. We always paid by the way. And um, they paid the first week, they paid the second week and then checks went out, but they bounced and then checks didn't go out. And all of a sudden I owed a couple thousand dollars to a TV station 
And Steve was saying the advertisers are drying up. Uh, he's blaming, you know, Ray Rawls and Ray is blaming Steve. And the advertisers they had up on a big wall as if they were real had all been alienated by now and there was no money. And I'm now out of pocket 2000 when I wasn't supposed to go out of pocket at all on that thing. So I said, you know, screw this. I'm, we're going to do an angle where you guys are freaking incompetent and I'm taking over. And it's going to become NWA Wildside. And we brought Ricky and Robert and the Rock and Roll Express as heels. And we established NWA Wildside basically based on a shoot. Um, the management of NCW was incompetent. And they couldn't handle their finances and they couldn't agree. And each of them would rip off the other in a heartbeat. So I just took over the basic day-to-day -day operation of, of as much as I could while Steve still generated whatever the gate was in the building and used that to pay whatever the bills were for the building and to keep it running. I did everything else, including handling the booking or getting other people to help me with the booking over time. And there quite a number of people, talented people, who were involved in helping and providing ideas during various times, and including our esteemed host here. Yeah, so absolutely. that was the beginning and what got Wildside going. And Wildside transitioned from being sort of a mixed match of what they were doing, had been doing in North Carolina for a couple of shows and old school Georgia boys and guys that can barely lock up and people that want to just hit each other with shit. And we slowly started transitioning into the place where you learned to be good and you established what your character was and learned to tell a story. And we started skewing away from trash uh, and using uh, gimmick matches and blood where appropriate rather than as the driving force of the promotion, we began skewing toward the development of talent. The impetus of that was probably the fact that we inherited one great star that was clear was going to be a great star, and that was A.J. Styles, who is as much my son as anyone could be at this point in my life. And um, he hated me, by the way, when I first came in, of course, because I was the invading damn Yankee, even though I grew up in Miami, Florida. And... Uh, <laughs> But but he was, in essence, the, the, the beginning. He was our genesis, quite literally, and an appropriate one for the young man. Um, but everything flowed from that because then people wanted to keep up with that development because people were paying attention. And then Air Paris had a great feud, and then Suicidal Tendencies was created, and that established other young guys. And then we started establishing more of our junior talent, the Jimmy Raves of the world. Tony Mameluke became part of what we were doing and was a tremendous teacher because while very young, he had had unique experience coming in and was able to help our equally young crew learn to do less and get more out of it. And we had Jeremy Lopez as a long-running junior champion that gave great, great credibility to what we were doing. And we had Jamie Noble come in at the time, Jamie Howard, I think he was called then. And we had all of these different people, many of whom went on to accomplish some really good stuff. And that sort of became the beginning. And then it became all shapes and sizes of folks started being drawn. So it wasn't just the little guys. It was the hot stuff Hernandez is the icebergs, the abysses as Prince Justice or Justice as we decided he should be. Um, and Stone Mountain at the beginning was, was the beginning of that big guy thing. The guy who sort of started breaking out and we just never were able to get him to that final spot, unfortunately. But we sort of got that reputation rather than the one Steve liked, which is let's put somebody through a table to light somebody on fire. Yeah, and, and you know, I think it's a testament to uh, your Charles Xavier-like mental abilities that I think you've anticipated, like, the next four questions that I had here. So you know how to save time, and you know the story is better than I do even. And um, uh, just backing up to AJ a little bit, uh, you know, what the, you, you said the first impression is that, that he didn't like you. Uh, where did that relationship turn the corner and, and become – the mentor relationship that you have still to this day where you're representing him and obviously his biggest advocate. Well, I, I, don't, I, I honestly can't identify a specific. I do know the turning point in him first being angry. And then I, I think thinking about it a little bit um, was uh, I booked him in a ladder match, but I booked him in a ladder match with, um, oh crap. Uh, why can't I think of his name right now? Uh, Tennessee Dad. guy, small, Say it again. Was it J.C. Daz? No, 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 no. Um, uh, East Tennessee guy came down uh, with, you know. Uh, 
uh, came down with Taylor, the court of, he was with oh, Eddie Trump. Golden, Eddie Golden, Eddie, Eddie Golden. Golden, very much so. Eddie, thank you so much. Uh, Eddie Golden, who, who exceptional worker, very good psychology, basic. You could call him a Southern wrestler, but the man knew how to work a hold, how to tell a story, and how to make stuff matter. And a lot of our crew didn't. They, they, uh, the young guys in particular were being trained by uh, the worst aspects rather than the best aspects of the ECWs of the world. They were being trained by the spots they were seeing rather than understanding there was more going on. Um, and, and then the Hardy syndrome had taken over big time, which had, even, which had taken backyard trampoline wrestling, you know, in. If you read you know, the Hardy's own books, they, they did not know how to really lock up when they were actually getting WWE spots. They had to be taught how to wrestle because they had taught themselves. And oh, they yeah. were going into places like NCW, and we had, we had Jeff come in at, uh, in Nashville, and they literally were learning too. In fact, Hardy Boys were actually assigned to me in Nashville for a half a minute before they got pulled up, literally. They were signed on a Monday, and they were drawn up to TV before we could book them the following Saturday. That's how quick it was. But regardless... That was sort of the position. Well, I put Eddie Golden in this ladder match, and I told Eddie, I want this thing to tell a story. I'm not worried about the spots. And there was one spot in the thing where AJ set up the ladder, Bob Bob put Eddie on it, went up top, did an amazing flippy thing. Eddie rolls out of the way, and he takes this ridiculously painful and dangerous bump. And it didn't really add anything. It just came out of nowhere. And I'm watching it, and, and I, I knew that he was going to do something like that. So when he came to the back, he was excited about the match. And I came up, and I looked, and he said, what do you think? And I said, I, I thought it sucked. I, I, you had an, I said, you had an opportunity to go out there and tell a hell of a story with somebody that can. You weren't out there with J.C. Daz. You weren't with a Jimmy Rave. You weren't with somebody else that's wanted, going to want to keep up with you spot to spot. You were with somebody that could tell a story and isn't a big bump guy but you were determined to be a big bump guy in that kind of match. You could have used the ladder in a much more intelligent way. You just chose not to. And I said, you're going to have to learn that you don't have to do more to get over. You have to figure out how to do less. And he looked at me like I had, you know, just, just, you know, uh, called him a Satan worshiper. And, <laughs> and, and that was, that was both one of our, our bad times but it really started opening the door to after I think he thought it through. He still defends that match, by the way. But regardless, after thinking it through, he began, I think, to realize when, you know, he he began learning that, well, you know what, maybe he's not, you know, a total monkey about this. And maybe he is trying to help me. And maybe he's got more influence than some of the other people I've I've dealt with, because all of a sudden we were hearing from. You know, WCW, Bob Ryder and Jeremy Barash were putting us over on the radio. Terry Taylor was in development, and I had been able to stop K. Crush from leaving till he finished up with AJ, which, you know, the guys are going, hmm, oh, okay, well, so he can call Terry Taylor. Well, that's interesting. Um, you know, we're, we're not used to that. We're, we're used to being able to call Brody Chase. So it was a, it was a different kind of thing. Um, and and I think he began to realize that I could help him. And more importantly, that I wasn't just being an ass, that I might have been abrupt, and I am, or blunt, and gosh knows, but I was actually trying to focus him toward what would get him where he needed to go. And then progressively over time, I put him into spots that became obvious as you look back at them as spots to develop him to where inevitably he ended up. At the time, he didn't know it, and maybe other people weren't paying attention, but I realized early on that I was a terrible promoter because I don't have the patience for it. Um, I can do half-assed performing in wrestling and have done a lot of it, but it's not something I enjoy. I do it because it's easy for me, basically, to do what little I can do, whether it's a bump here or going out and cutting a promo that I don't have to think about it whether people sometimes have to. I can just go do it, but that's fine. But it's not what I aspired to do in the business. I didn't aspire to that spot. I wanted to find a niche, and my niche became developing talent and the mentoring and trying to figure out how to, as Tommy Dreamer said to me once when he was in talent development, I help people fulfill their dreams or what they believe their dreams to be. And that sort of became what I decided was going to be my spot. 
And I used to tell the talent, and you've heard me tell them this, that I'm not going to be the guy that gets you, that pays you, but I'm trying to be the guy that gets you paid. I want you to build up enough of a reputation with what we do with you that when you go someplace else, people want to pay you because you're a wild side guy. And that inevitably is what happened with a large percentage of the crew that came out of that building. They went various places, and some, like AJ, make hundreds of thousands of dollars now. Not everybody does, but an awful lot of people have gotten at least a little bit of a ride um, on the wrestling roller coaster and haven't just been an indie wonderkin that you know was the hero in their own backyard for their whole career. Um, we've been able to get people out the door, and, and that's really what I enjoy doing. I, uh, and it is the frustrating side that it doesn't always last. It, it only goes as long as it does, and you always hope that everybody gets the spot and it just keeps going and they get paid over and over and over and over and live happily ever after. But this is the entertainment business, and it doesn't work that way. It, it's often feast or famine, but you know, very interesting that that you, um, in the early days of Wildside, in sort of this abstract way, were already doing what you're now doing professionally, essentially, which was, uh, you know, building a, as you just explained, building a stable of talent and getting them booked. Now, out of all these guys that came through here, we got about eight minutes left here on part one of this interview. As I stated, fans, I imagine this is probably going to be a multifaceted thing, so we'll definitely revisit with Mr. Barron's, as I know he's got a lot more to tell about NWA Wildside. But uh, yes, I, have to, I have to go to dinner. I have to go to dinner tonight with Stephen Platinum, so the the things are, are certainly different. So, so go ahead. <laughs> and the Georgia Wrestling News Boards are now afloat. Um, but um, what, uh, what I was going to ask was, you know, AJ is the ultimate success. Um, look on the other side of that, was there like one guy that you were just absolutely certain was a can't miss? This guy's going to get, uh, he's going to be dominating the world that just didn't, for whatever reason, get noticed by that next level. Ah. Uh... Closest to, to being able to say that is I, we got really, really close to getting uh, Stone Mountain signed. Um, I mean, really close. The magazines were in love with him. He was getting his picture in. Billy After was in love with him and had influence at the time and was doing segments on our show, in fact, as he did WOW Magazine. Uh, we did a, we did a, a segment, a, a party thing, an interview with that. WWE was was uh, – because he had all – you know, while he had limitations – he had a, an amazing size look thing going, but Stoney just would, you know, come and go. And, and it was one of those is just when we were going. The other one and the most obvious one is, as you talk about coming and going, would be Jason Cross. Um, Jason, interestingly, had been offered a WCW deal way back. In fact, literally when I was still in Loganville, as did AJ, I had consulted AJ not to take the deal because I had watched the match he had had, and I, I knew he wasn't ready, and I knew he'd be just – sucked into a system where gosh knows what would happen. Um, maybe I was right, maybe I was wrong, but it seemed to have turned out okay for him inevitably. Jason's dad went to the meeting and didn't like um, the process. He didn't like Eric Bischoff, and uh, uh, Chris Canyon was, in fact, the, the, the guy doing all of the scouting on this, um, and they were just grabbing young guys all over the place. That sounds odd. Bless, bless your heart, Chris. I didn't mean it that way. And um, so we we – we, uh, I, I, Jason was one of those guys that we kept putting a, rock, putting a rocket ship up his butt, and he kept doing tremendously. And he had gotten to the spot where he was going to be booked in the Northeast. We had just put the title on him, and he didn't make an airplane. And you're going, crap. Um, and, and then we had various things like that. So Jason would be an example in a minor way, and, and I love him to death, but, but, uh, but Big Eddie, but Iceberg, um, had an opportunity, I got him at TNA, and he was so respectful of a guy he worked, Norman Smiley, that he, he basically screwed his spot. Um, and uh, because he was supposed to go out and eat Norman up, and he didn't. He, in fact, he did everything and sold for the big wiggle. He did some impressive stuff, but he didn't do the iceberg stuff that we knew that we knew would get him over and that what had gotten Jerry Jarrett to agree to book him for a sh four show run. And he had, you know, it, and he was the anti hardcore guy. They had a whole angle built around him that they were willing to go forward on. And when he didn't do what they told him to do exactly in the match with Norman, because he just didn't want to job Norman out. He was too respectful. 
he ended up losing his spot and he only did four shows and out. And, you know, I feel bad about those moments because, you know, I certainly wouldn't have wanted him to make that decision. Uh, but it is what it is. Um, and, and those would be the ones I would identify. And, and as I talk about all of them, um, Stoney, limited, big, had an opportunity, particularly in a WWE machine, if they protected him and he might have made money. Uh, Jason Cross had the same kind of physical ability as AJ, just didn't have the same head. And Iceberg may well be the best big man I've ever seen work. Um, so it's, you know, I, when you see that kind of talent and you only know them potentially because of what they did primarily in Wildside, that's simply a shame. Yeah, it, it is unfortunate. I know you talk about that with Iceberg, and, and I'm sure, you know, he's, he's still a dear friend to this day. I'm sure he stands by his decision there. But I remember in the early days when we were trying to build him up as the monster in Wild Side and that kind of being an issue there, you know, he's just such a nice guy. I mean, you know, and, and, and God love him for it. But, you know, we, we're like, we're trying to make you a monster, brother. You don't have to bump for the 200-pound guy, especially on the first yeah, drop well, but and at the same time, just um, you know, Abyss had that problem too. Justice and we, we, you know, I, we, I used to have to you know, literally slap him around. I mean, I remember when Hot Stuff came the first time and he did all these cool things, do the dive over the rope, all this other stuff. He came to the back and he asked how the match was, and I told him it was terrible. <laughs> and he looked at me because no one had ever told him that. He had always been told that you know his stuff smelled better than anybody else's. He tells that story now. He says, you know, and his client is, and Bill is not the biggest guy on the face of the earth, you know. So I'm sitting here looking at this guy that could crush me, and I'm just telling him the truth, which is you can do these impressive things, but you have to remember what size you are and who you're in the ring with. And Abyss had the same thing. Abyss would, would, would bump for, for a chimpanzee. It just it was ridiculous. And you just had to go, you know, stop it. Please make people chop your tree down, you know, get you down, make you the big guy that you are. All these impressive things you do can still get into play, but they're more impressive if the people don't expect them from the big guy. If you go out and work as a cruiserweight as a big guy, then you're just a cruiserweight rather than a big guy. Be a big guy and then astound them with that one thing you do, you know, the dive the taker does over the top. You have to wait for that dive. That dive doesn't necessarily come in every match, but when it does, holy crap. You know, there's always been a, the spoiler back in the day walking on the ropes. You went, holy crap, there's a big guy doing a really amazing thing. But you, you had to pick your spots on it, and around that, the guy was a big guy. So I, I think that's one of the things people, because the little guys started getting a lot of notice, they were getting more of the holy shit chance. Big guys began to go, I want a holy shit chant too. You know, so I got to break a table. I got to dive off something. I got to, you know, do a uh, senton off the top, you know, and literally I that want became the, the mentality. Fans to love me. <laughs> yes. So all of a sudden, big guys started to think the only way they could get over was being little. Yeah, and it, uh, so, it didn't work but out I will so still little. maintain iceberg, uh, uh, at in his prime, if not the best, one of the best working big men in the business. Oh, I'd agree. And I think had, you know, his career just whatever happened, he got a, a different or better opportunity for himself and, and had succeeded, would have changed probably a lot about mainstream wrestling and big guys. He was such a throwback to Abdullah. He was such a badass. Um, and, you know, we, we can really go on and on. I'm going to have Iceberg on the show for sure, and have Jeff G. Bailey as well. But, Bill, we're, we're down to a minute. I just want to thank you so much for taking your time, and we've got so much more to tell. As I knew, we barely uh, touched the tip of the iceberg tonight, my friend. Hey, there you go. And you've got a nice, another iceberg mention in at the end. Good job. Oh. <laughs> uh, but, yes, yeah. uh, we, we'll definitely, just as soon as you can do it, we'll set up and, and do uh, a continuing series of this. Hey, you know, you know, hey, you know me, and uh, if the fans don't, uh, as long as you get to me before my bedtime, I'm probably good to go almost any time. <laughs> Outstanding. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Bill Barron. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Goodbye.
All right, that was the first edition of the NWA Wildside Chronicles, fans, and we are out of time. Thank you for joining us. This is the Reverend. Keep one foot in the gutter, one fist in the gold. See ya.